Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Father God, we're here to bring glory to your name. Let it be your words and certainly not mine. Let it be your wisdom. Father, not mine. Lord, your word feeds us and your instruction is to feed the sheep. So, Father, just thank you for what you're going to do this morning. We declare you as Lord and Savior. Lord, in this church, we glorify you. You're on our throne. In Jesus' name. So for those that don't know me, I'm Stephen Bjerking. I also serve as an elder in this church. And we've been uh, studying uh, Matthew 5, chapter 5, the Beatitudes. Uh, I was reminded this week of something that happened to me in high school. It was actually right at the end of high school, the very important uh, assignment that I had in year 12. And it was a physics assignment. I uh, had to show the flight of a ping pong ball, I can't remember the details, but I took it so seriously that once I got this assignment, well, it came with a one page of basically instructions on what I was to do in this assignment, and there might have been a few points in there, and I remember skim reading it and going, right, I got this, and I went home and I bought all this equipment and set it up, and for hours every night, I was straight onto this assignment, up until the date it was due, I worked on, I worked on it, actually, did a mammoth effort, I was pretty proud of myself, it was like this thick, photos and just all sorts of stuff going on in this assignment. And the night before, it was during, it might have been a couple of nights, I had a friend call me, Adrian, I still remember his name, and he said, Steve, I haven't started yet, this assignment. <laughs> Steve's here. Hey, Steve. And he goes, I haven't started, I haven't, um, started this assignment yet. Uh, how do you do it? I'm like, you're kidding me. Like, there's no way you can do it. Dude, I said, I've got a document this thick. I've been working on this for countless hours. I don't know, you just have to do something, but there's no way it's going to work out for you. So anyway, next day I proudly handed in my assignment and he had something pretty thin he managed to hand in. A few weeks later, when it came to get the grades, mine came back with a D. And uh, he got an A+. <laughs> You know, I, I'll always remember this, and I, I know that God reminded me of it, because well, what he actually did, I'll start with what I did. I got the instructions, and I skim read it, and I went and did my effort, my assignment, what I was going to do. I was going to make this great assignment. I never even went back to my instructions. What he did on such limited short time is he got the points, there might have been 10 points, and he made them headings. So the first point was heading one, and he wrote under it. Point two, he wrote under it. Point three, he wrote under it. He actually addressed what needed to be addressed, and as such, he got an A+, plus and I almost failed. And it just, I know God reminded me of this, because, you know, often we make religion, Christianity, our walk with the Lord, our understanding of God into something that is religious. And I believe Matthew 5 is a lot about this, how the religious leaders, the Pharisees, really missed God's instruction. They'd interpreted the law that was actually designed to govern the attitude of their hearts. It was designed to be like a measuring stick to the health of their hearts. Was their heart healthy before God or was that unhealthy? There was a purpose of that law, but they're gone and turned into some complicated, self-righteous mess that was actually full of wickedness and, and deceit and had missed the entire point of the law. And on that topic, and we're about to dig into the second half of uh, Matthew, I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose a question. And James, if you can put up the first verse, which is actually the last verse of today's section of Scripture, verse 48. Jesus says this, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. How is that possible? You know, it's, it, it seems like we're burdened with this uh, impossible task of being burdened. And how do we reconcile with the fact that we all know that we fall short? And we're told this yoke is easy. Actually, the yoke is for children to take upon themselves. The kingdom of God belongs to these. How do we reconcile this? So in last week, Steve preached in the morning. Uh, and then he came back, actually, for night. We had quite a large group come to hear last. I think there was like two and a half hours of preaching in total. That's probably why he's asked me to preach today. It was, a, it was an amazing set of scriptures and very challenging. Actually, who felt challenged? Who felt convicted? Who felt condemned? Well, there's a, yeah, there's a couple of hands. This is good. Let's have a read of uh, John 3, 17. We, all, we always hear John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but receive eternal life. The next verse is that he didn't send his son 
to condemn the world, but to save us. The reason, the very reason why Jesus came was to save us from what we've done. Not what he's done to us. He came to save us. We can actually goes on to say we condemned ourselves. But can it be conviction? Absolutely. Can it be division? Yes. When the truth of God comes, it comes like a sword. And you know what we do? Our human nature is we're fence sitters. We like to be comfortable, especially in the West. And so when Jesus brings that sword down, we can't sit on that fence. We've got to choose a side. That's the purpose as well of the law, to make us choose a side. Because by sitting on the fence, we're not choosing, we are choosing. And we know in Revelations it talks about lukewarm Christians. It's not good. So, it's a time now to get a little uncomfortable. And uncomfortable is a good thing. I'm going to steal an analogy of a, of a man called Ray Comfort. Some of you probably know him. I like this analogy. He was trying to convince a, a guy on the aeroplane that he needed a parachute. Uh, and he didn't want to believe him, so he hung him out by the, the back of the plane by his ankles for a couple of minutes. And he came back and said, yeah, that's scary. I want this parachute. And in life, Christ is our parachute. And sometimes it's good to have a good hard look at the reality of our situation to realize our need for a savior in every aspect of our life. It's a good type of fear there. The proverb says, um, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's a good type of fear that draws us to God, leads us to Christ, and makes us uncomfortable. It comes a time, and I like this, how Steve put this um, last week, where God is going to pull back the covers of our lives. In Hebrews it says, to each of us is appointed to die once and then judgment. And actually, on that day of judgment, it's just not the good. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is talking to the church, he says, we will receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil that we have done in this earthly body. So it's the good and the bad. It's good to pull back those covers now, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing in Matthew 5, and have a good look at what's under there. You see, this is what he did with the Pharisees, and what he saw under there wasn't nice. And Steve's example, I never considered this last week, was, and he covered murder, divorce, and adultery. Yeah, those first three, at the, the, um, the first part of Matthew 5. The Pharisees, although they kept the law, they were actually guilty of murder. See, they couldn't murder Jesus under their law, but actually they got the Gentiles to do it. They got to the Romans to do it, and then they're like, well, we didn't, we didn't do it. We, didn't, we kept the law. But Jesus pulled back the cover of their hearts and said, your murder is at heart. And this is important that we do the same thing. We have a good, sober look at ourselves. And allow the law to do what it's supposed to do. The law of Christ is supposed to correctly divide truth in our hearts so that we can live a victorious life in the Lord, in Christ. Amen? So Jesus, so last week we did murder, divorce, and adultery. And, uh, and now Jesus is going to turn to the issue of oaths in verse, uh, oaths in verse 33. So if we can have a look at that, 33... 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you not, we must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, because it's God's throne, or by earth, because it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. But let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no, and anything more than that is from the evil one. The Pharisees are very familiar with the law that was given to them in uh, exile. Um, if you can uh, put up Numbers 30, verse 2, I'm going to put the law up. Uh, it says this. This is a law that the Pharisees are very familiar with. And it says... Did I have that on my list? Oh, really? Numbers 30, verse 2. All right, we've got it. 
When a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to put himself under an obligation, he must not break his word. He must do what he promised. So they knew that if they were to invoke the name of Yahweh, the name of God, in an oath, it meant you better keep it. And if not, there were going to be consequences. And an oath can be something like, I swear to God that I'm going to such and such, pay back that debt or I'm going to do whatever. It must be kept at all costs. But they thought, well, see, this is Pharisees, the way they think. They're using the law. They don't care about the heart motive and they're looking at finding a loophole. They're thinking, well, maybe if I swear by the temple, maybe I swear by my head, then they're not going to be accountable to God. They're sort of removing the fear of God out of it and now they're in control again. That's what they're thinking. It's sort of like premeditated deceit. Yeah? So you're kind of, you, you, you're, not, you're not wanting, it's like a kid <laughs> puts their hands behind their back and promises something, but their, their fingers are crossed. They're not, they have no intention of keeping the promise. But God, Jesus is saying here, well, I own the earth. I own the temple. I own the head. It's all mine. You can't swear by that either, and you're going to be accountable to your words, no matter what you swear by. Your word is your oath, and you're bound by it. See, this is a problem with the Pharisees, is they lost their fear of God. They didn't fear God. Actually, they had a rebellious spirit. And Jesus was reinstating that fear by basically saying, you're going to be held account for your words. He knew that they were lying. They were pulling them up, pulling them up on that lying. Actually, we're told that instruction is it will be accountable for every careless word. So we're to, we're to be careful of our words. We're to be people of our words. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be a no. Actually, last week I was in Melbourne reflecting with a friend of mine. We had a, like 20 years ago, we had uh, one of our staff that we really trusted, and he ended up stealing from us. It surprised us because... We didn't think it was his character, but, and I didn't even believe it at the start. But when we confronted him about it, he denied it. He was lying. He doubled down on that lie, and then he actually said these words. He said, I, I bet my, what did he say? I swear on my daughter's life. Now, it's interesting because I was reflecting this with my business partner in Melbourne, and he doesn't, we don't even really remember, and he's not, he's not uh, a believer. But yet, the one thing he remembers was not what this guy did wrong or what he stole, but he remembered those words because he brought it up to me. Do you remember when he said he swore on, he swore on his daughter's life? How does it make you feel if you're going to swear on your daughter's life? Terrible. How about if you swear on the temple? It sort of has an implication, doesn't it, that that person can't be trusted. If you've got someone in your life that you trust, you're fine. You just believe them at their word. They don't need to go a lot, go, come around and say, well, I promise you I'm going to do this. Or... It definitely dilutes that, uh, the credibility of that, of that person. It's important that we don't do that. We don't need to do that. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be a no. Common ones for us would probably be like, I promise. I promise that I'll do this. So if you're hearing that in yourself, it's probably a little indication that you need to work on your integrity like with that person. So be a person of your word. It is binding. You shouldn't have to take an oath. And let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Remembering that Jesus demonstrated this by his word, didn't he? In his word... He made, by his own word, he made promises to us, but it was through his character. He told us he came here for us to die on that cross. He told his disciples where he was going, and he, he told us why. You know, he knew that he needed to come here for us. And our entire salvation is based on him keeping his word, isn't it? In Proverbs 6, Verses 1 to 3. It says this, My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor or entered into agreement with a stranger, you have been snared by the words of your mouth and trapped by the words from your mouth. 
Do this then, my son, and free yourself, for you have put yourself in your neighbor's power. Go humble yourself and plead with your neighbor. I have an example of this, and this is one that I often use on this topic. So when Corey and I were in Hong Kong, we had a maid that looked after our office and our home for about a decade, and she was employed by us. Six days a week, she would work for us. And her first commitment was for us. So her name was Virginia. If, she, if Virginia went around and started making oaths to people, oh, this Tuesday, I'll be there between 12 and 4 p.m., I'm going to give you a hand, and then she's not with us, like, she's our maid. She, there's an expectation there that she works for us. Does that make sense? And all of a sudden on Tuesday, she's not there, or then Wednesday, and then Friday, because she's making these oaths. In the same way, we're servants of the living God. Who are we to go around making oaths outside of his will? Does that make sense? So be careful of your oaths, because there are some that are holy. Obviously, marriage is a good example of that, and God permits it. But there are, there are others that are only going to serve as an obstacle between you and your relationship with God. And I can tell you one of the things that we see in ministry often are people that have made what we call unholy oaths or vows. It's, it's actually a common thing. I'll give you some examples. Um, or the, the common one would be, I will never love anyone else but you early on in a relationship and then it breaks up and then they find actually they find it difficult to give their heart um, to anybody else you'll be, you'll be the only person that I love or I will always be a failure these words that have always or never in them they can actually easily become oaths in our language we can actually become into covenant with somebody with our with our language, with our oaths. The Bible says what you bind in heaven, and what you bind on earth, you bind in heaven. So be very careful. And you might even see these playing out in your life. It's one of the major, one of, one of the bigger things we pray through. So I'm going to open up. We're going to open up also at the end of the service. If you, if you can see those playing out in your life, come forward, and God will break that yoke off you. So we're careful of our words. Why? We know God created the whole world with his very word and we created it in his image. Uh, our words are powerful. So Jesus moves on to retribution in verse 38. He says this, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. This is one of the 613 laws that was given to Moses to govern two and a half million Israelites a few months into their exile. You can imagine um, they had no king, they had no pharaoh anymore, and they had a heap of chaos. And the law wasn't to take be taken literally, or but it could be, I guess, but it was really meant to say, let the punishment fit the crime. And it was also to limit retribution to the actual size of the crime. You know, this is a common thing, and in some cultures still, where there's some random, kind of like vigilante type, um, like justice, uh, and then it escalates over time into some sort of never-ending cycle of retribution. Actually, uh, family feuding in some cultures is a really big thing. You hit someone's dog in the car, you want to keep driving. There's parts in the Philippines like this because what happens is the entire family will come after your family and then there's retribution and it just blows out of um, control and it can actually go on for generations. So there was a law there given to govern the heart and the law in which it was applied. But here we, ha here we have the Pharisees 1,400 years later that are twisting this law and using it to justify revenge and retaliation. They were taking the law into their own hands to take revenge. And in verse 39, it goes on to say, do not resist an evil person. So basically, don't stoop to their level. Don't respond in kind. You don't seek vengeance as the world would seek vengeance or vindication. This is a, a great verse that will help frame this in Romans 12, 
verse 9, because the framing is, in, is, is a faith framing. We need, to, we need to frame this in the context of faith. In Romans 12, verse 9, it says this. That's the wrong verse. Is that Romans 12, verse 9? What's that next verse after that? I always check my verses. I can read it out. 19, sorry. Romans 12, 19. This is about not taking revenge. Paul's instruction to the Roman church. It says, do not take revenge. Do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. That's interesting. Because it is written, vengeance belongs to me and I will repay, says the Lord. A lot of people think God's a soft God, but he says, vengeance is mine. He is a God that loves justice. Amen? But actually, we're instructed there to leave room for him. How do we not leave room for God's wrath? It's quiet today. Come on, Will, you normally got an answer. Sorry, what's the question again? Ah, caught you out. <laughs> How would we not leave room for God's wrath? Because it says they leave room for his wrath. When we act by our own will. When we act by our own will. Exactly right. So our natural fleshly reaction is someone does something wrong to us is to react back. If you can put that verse up there one more time, James. So it takes something, doesn't it, to allow God to move on our behalf, to vindicate us. And who's been in this situation before? Yes. Do you know this takes faith because the world doesn't work like this? Someone comes against you, a natural reaction is, I want vengeance, I want to vindicate. But God is saying, you know what? I'll do that for you. I'll do that for you. But do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for my wrath. Allow me to do that. So we're taught to love our enemies. We're taught to forgive them. We're taught things that actually would be crazy to the world. But that's what faith is, isn't it? Faith is crazy to the world. In Psalm 37, verse 6, it says this. It says, making your righteousness. <laughs> Somebody's on my verses today. Shine like dawn and your justice. It's a great verse. <laughs> but the one I was after, it's, it says, he will vindicate you in broad daylight and publicly defend your just cause. He will vindicate you in broad daylight. So let's leave room for God to do that. For us, we have instructions to actually forgive, and to even love our enemies. And it makes sense. I mean, it all makes sense. God's character, he's a just God. This is where we get our sense of justice from. We're created in his image. Jesus goes on to verse 41, and it says this. If anyone forces you to go one mile, we go with him two Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So in those days, Roman law was that soldiers could come up to you and say, hand you their backpack and say, carry it for one mile, up to one mile, but no more. That was the law. It actually had a name to it, investment or something like that. There was an actual, there was a name for it. Um, and a backpack could be up to 40 kilograms or so. Now, you know already the Jews hated the yoke of... Uh, of the Roman government. So imagine them being asked <laughs> and they're given a heavy backpack to walk a mile. So that's where this comes from. And Jesus is saying to them, take it a second mile. Imagine the type of conversations you could have with that soldier on the second mile when you're like, ah, oh, so I don't keep carrying it for a while. Can you imagine? It will change everything. It will certainly change the atmosphere of, uh, of your walk and your ability to better um, relate. But there's something that's often misunderstood with Christians, and because a lot of people read this verse, they're like, well, hang on, does that mean that we're as Christians, we as Christians, are we to be used and abused and manipulated 
and controlled. Who's ever thought that? They've looked at this verse and it sort of hasn't made any sense. Imagine giving money to every person that asks, and it won't be long before you're poor, your family's on the streets, and you're encouraging laziness and, and crime. Like, it's just not what Jesus intended, nor did you see it in his life or the life of the apostles. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, they weren't manipulated or controlled or used. And uh, he courageously exposed liars and cheaters. And even if you look at the context of Scripture, when Paul was talking to Timothy, he actually said that people need to provide for their families. If they don't, they're actually worse than unbelievers. Pretty strong, isn't it? And then to the Thessalonian church, Paul also gave a rule saying, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. <laughs> there you go. Yep. So it's not, it's, not, it's not Jesus saying just give everything to everybody. Um, not to be taken advantage of. We did see, however, dem- see Jesus um, and the early church demonstrate exactly that in their generosity, even sacrificial generosity to bring glory to the Lord, to love even their enemies, Jesus obviously being the greatest demonstrator of that, uh, and turning the other cheek, which is what Christ did on the cross for the will of the Father to be fulfilled. Not for him to be used and abused, but to fulfill the work of his father. And this is something that happens when we go that extra mile. If you guys think about a time that you've done that, and you can see the impact that it's caused in their life, can you guys think of an example of it? There's a few nods. So I have a little personal story um, from Corey and myself, and it was when... When we moved back, we're buying this house um, here in Coffs Harbour. We had a real issue with the people selling the house. They were, they were difficult. And um, they caused an issue such that um, we got an extra charge of a few thousand dollars on our solicitor bill, but he did too. And it was completely his doing. And we were fine with it. Certainly wasn't ideal, but we got a, a phone call and Cora and I were in a car I didn't quite get it, so I listened to the voicemail, which I'm really happy about, and it was just this owner of the house just furious that he had to pay this extra money on his solicitor's bill. This solicitor charged both him and us for the same change. Um, And then Corey and I, we were just full of like, do you remember this? We were so upset. We were, uh, because it was was unjust, it it was unjust. Like it was was completely his fault that he caused this situation. And so our flesh rose up, we're like, well you caused it, and we have to pay this as well. You you should pay yours and ours. We had all these these thoughts. But then we actually said, well let's pray on it. So Corey and I actually held hands and we prayed on this. Lord, can we have your wisdom in this situation? Something happened, it's one of my more special memories. There was an atmosphere that changed in the car and the Lord, spoke to our hearts, can't explain how we did it, but he basically said, offer to pay for their entire solicitor's bill. <laughs> it was like the opposite of what you normally do. So anyway, I wrote him an email and I, sa- and I actually said that, in, okay, I, I not only will pay for mine, but we, we would really like to bless you and, pray f- and pay for your entire solicitor bill. He, he was rocked. He was completely rocked. I think he was a man or they were, had a lot of people try to take advantage of them. Um, He didn't know how to handle that at all. In fact, it opened up an opportunity that Corey and I prayed for his wife and we shared the gospel with him. That opportunity wouldn't have been there. He did actually come back and say, no, don't pay for my bill, just for my part of it. (laughs) The thing is, you know, that that extra mile when I had to battle everything in the flesh that wanted to do the opposite of that. But it came through prayer. It's just the Holy Spirit's quiet voice. Let's be different to the world, hey? Let's shine. We can shine. We did that in earlier, Matthew, with, with the salt of the earth. We're to shine. We're to show love to our enemies and, and give generously, even sacrificially. So in verse 43, Matthew 43, it's 543, it says this. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Interesting. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends out rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
Do you see how Jesus says at the start, you have heard? He didn't actually say it is written. Why? It's not in the law. Actually, what is in the law is found um, in Leviticus chapter 19, where it says, you shall love your neighbor. And the Pharisees conveniently sort of added on to the end uh, and hate your enemy. And it was convenient in the way that they were using this to justify their their treatment um, of, of their enemies under the law. It's a loophole, isn't it? Getting around, oh, they're not my neighbors, it's okay to hate them. Then it went from enemies to to Gentiles or Samaritans or anyone that they would look down on and disregard as as trash or second-class citizens. And and that's true, stinky religion. That's what it does. It looks down on others. But think about it. Who are we to decide who we love or not? God doesn't tell us to be friends with everybody. Everybody. But in the same way, that comparison I made to the maid, like we are his servants. Who are we to say, I'm going to love that person and give them my time, but that person, I'm not. No, I'm not going to do that. I hate that person. We are about our master's business. Amen? Amen. And God God is calling a people to his own. And it's not us to decide who we're going to hate. In fact, we're told not to hate, but to love. And if, for my previous example, it was only through that act of love and generosity do I have an opportunity to share the gospel. Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. This is what separates us from the world. Hey, do you guys remember, it wasn't until, I can't remember how long ago, last year, there was a police officer, a former Dallas police officer, Amber Geiger. Who knows that story? All over the news um, she was a police officer, ran into the wrong house, heard that, and then shot the man dead uh, on the couch, Botham Jean. Who's heard this? Okay, it's just a few people. So, because you haven't heard it, I'll go. So basically, she just got the wrong house. A police officer runs in, um, he's just on the couch, a really good man, <laughs> and uh, just shot him dead. And so I just want to show the YouTube clip. It's only two and a half minutes, but it's actually the courtroom. Amber ended up, is serving currently 10 years in jail for murder for this. Like, he was completely defenseless. He was literally just lying back on his couch. But this is, um, this is um, Botham's brother, Brant, Gene, who's taken the stand. I can, I can speak stand. for myself. I, I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And... I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see I I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can can I give her a hug, please? Please. Amazing. Yes.
It's wild, isn't it? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's only possible by the love of Christ, isn't it? That's impossible any other way. And that hug said it all. We're told to pray for those who persecute us, to love them. That doesn't mean to be friends on Brant and Amber. Well, they won't be friends. But he loved her. And I can tell you that love is shone. If you look how many times that has been viewed, it's been around the world as a proclamation of God's goodness and the power of forgiveness. That man was a light for Christ. But wow, did it cost him, didn't it? It cost him his anger, cost him his hatred, every, every right to hate that police officer, every right. But he chose love. You see how it's a choice? It's interesting as we step into it, we're walking by faith and then God allows it to happen. So all these things are only done by his strength, not by our strength. We can't, we can't do that. We couldn't have made that decision in the car. But when we lay it before the Lord, his Holy Spirit who dwells within us makes all these things possible. But that's faith. How easy is it just to go the way of the world? Because that's what our flesh does. That was quite a sacrifice. You know, when Jesus died for us, he died while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, while we were rebellious and hating him. He, he is, is the greatest demonstration of that. Let's have a look at rewards from Matthew 5, verse 46 to 48. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. So what reward? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's be different in this world. If we're just doing what the world is doing, what, how are we different? How can we be a light? How can we, we be sold? When we step out and want to be different, it's God that empowers us. It's his spirit that we carry with us. And when people look in our eyes, they just don't see us, they see the Lord at work in us. We're called to be Christ's ambassadors. It's quite a job we have there to reflect Christ, isn't it? But it's good to know that it's his work in us. If we have a look at Revelations 22, verse 12, it says this. This is Jesus. And this is what we have to look forward to. I can read it out. It says, Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. So these are the rewards that we're going to have as we walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, not as we do our desires for God or try to please God or our plans for God. All that stuff gets burned up. Actually, it, the Bible says in John 15 that he's not only called you to himself, but he's prepared good works for all of you to do. And as we walk in those works, which we can only do by faith, God's coming back to reward us for them. So as I finish, I just want to circle back to the original question asked at the start, just as Jesus closes with this verse, and he says, if you can put it back up there, James, verse 48, it's an important one to get right. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We know that Jesus didn't set an impossible standard for us to keep. In 1 John, it says, we sin. It says, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. So we know we sin. We know we fall way short. 
Jesus was particularly good at exposing that in this chapter, wasn't he? Pulling back the covers of the heart and then showing exactly what was in there. See, these Pharisees externally, they, they looked great. But actually, Jesus could see their hearts. Do you know that they were called whitewashed tombs? What's a tomb? What's inside a tomb? A dead person, bones, flesh, maggots. So religion does that. It can look great on the outside, but actually, it's horrific on the inside. False righteousness or self-righteousness. John the Baptist picked them up, picked that up too. He said, you brood of vipers. Then he said, keep fruit. They produced fruit in keeping with repentance. He could see they didn't have a heart of repentance. They hadn't laid their heart before the Lord, so they weren't able to produce the fruit that can only come through a genuine repentant heart and submission to Christ. That's the only way it can happen. We are by nature rebellious until something very special happens. Now, Jeff touched on a number of these points, so thank you, Jeff. In Ephesians 1, it says that you were included in Christ. In Christ, we're in him. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. If you belong to Christ, it says in Romans, you will, ha- you will have the Holy Spirit. Who here belongs to Christ? Do you know the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives within you? Whoever does not have that Spirit... Come forward at the end. I love, we, there's a number of us would love to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He absolutely is the only way. Obedience. Who's contemplated obedience over this last week to God's word? A number of you, you know, that's what this conviction does, isn't it? The conviction brings like a, where am I before God? And the Bible actually says, take sober judgment and see if you belong to the faith. How important is it to pull back the covers of our life and ask the Holy Spirit to show me, am I walking with you? Am I relying on your righteousness or mine? Am I in rebellion to you? Have I bought into a false gospel? There's plenty of that around today, and the Bible warns us about it, to ensure that you belong to Christ. Obedience is not optional. In fact, it is our act of love to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he says me. That's why he says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. You will see my kids by the, by the way that I obey me. It is the genuine fruit of a believer. Some of today's instructions and last week's instructions, put them in a place. They will work, absolutely, but they will only work by the power of the Holy Spirit and a life submitted to Him. Just like anything in the Bible, you can, if you, if you practice it outside of Christ, it will have some value. It will, because the Bible's got good instruction. But it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us, as a, that marks us on that day of judgment, that gives us the power to genuinely overcome sin. In Isaiah 61, it says God binds up the broken heart. He sets the captives free and proclaims the good news to the poor in spirit. I just want to show two more verses and I'm finishing up. This is important. I remember when Corey was first, I might have said this already, when Corey was, uh, was first born again, we were driving along, and she heard as clear as anything, my child, prepare yourself, I'm coming back. We literally pulled to the side of the road, and Corey was looking up for the clouds. This is, it was pretty out there. I didn't even know God could speak like that. But Corey was actually, wow, like God's instruction of us, and it's actually, I'm pretty sure it's the last verse in the Bible, come soon, Jesus. He is coming soon. Amen. Second Corinthians 5.21 says this, that... He made the one who did not know sin. Who didn't know sin? Who's the only person that walked on the... Yep. To be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of who? God's, not of ours. Of God's righteousness. We need to make sure that we are truly in him. There's a covenantal relationship that we have with Christ. That's the righteousness right there that saves us, guys. It's the Lord's righteousness. 
It's not ours. And last verse, I love this verse, Hebrews 10, verse 14. It says this, For by a single offering, he, that's Jesus, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So he has done a work and perfected for all time for all of those that are in Christ. But then we have this part here, who are being sanctified. There's a work that the Lord does as we obey him. We are being sanctified through obedience. And that's why in, in, um, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says that everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must depart from wickedness because we're no longer in rebellion to Christ. We obey him and allow his power to demolish sin in our lives, to set us free, his power, our obedience. Amen. So again, I'm just going to repeat that invitation. No, I'll do that again after the benediction. So for now, I'll pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for this word. I want to thank, thank you for your words. They are challenging, Father. They are. You offend, you're willing to offend us, Lord, to sift our sin to the surface, to reveal the condition of our hearts, Lord, so that you can deal with them. We can truly be free in this life, Lord, with you. We don't need to be entangled by sin that so easily ensnares us. Father, thank you that you didn't come to condemn us, Lord, but you came to set us free. Lord, let us not be religious in the way that we hold down and we put on false fronts and we, we don't deal with the issues, Lord, that do nothing but chain us down, Father, but instead, Lord, let us listen to your words and apply them to our lives. Confess our sins. Lord, you're faithful and just and you cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, I thank you for this word this morning. I thank you for the whole gospel of Matthew, Lord. It really speaks to us. And yeah, in Jesus' name.